I come to you in the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Please be seated. This is not a feel-good story. Today is not a feel-good day. And this will not be a feel-good message. Nor should it be. This story is a reality check. This day is a reality check. A day to pause and self-reflect. Reflect slowly. Reflect with honesty. Reflect and deepen with compassion and awareness our brokenness, our flaws, our attachments to greed, power, and selfish, self-serving behavior. It is a reality check that even though we have within us a divine spirit that can carry us and guide us and empower us to be and do what is good, right, and just in this world, we also have an evil motivated and fed by fear, greed, and attachment to people and things that are of this world. Attachment to getting ahead or having an advantage over another, an attachment to control what we want controlled in this world, to control another person or another institution to manipulate change that is for the good of the individual or a few individuals instead of working for change for the good of all or for the good of those on the margins, or those who are oppressed. This evil spirit can carry us as well, and guide us, and empower us to be and do what is not good and just in this world. If you just heard this story that I read or you reread it for yourself later today and you find yourself in some sort of disbelief, right? Like maybe even feeling it viscerally. How in the world can those people of that time do what they did to our Lord and Savior to an innocent man, to a teacher and a prophet? then I'm going to suggest that you pause and reread it again. Read it in all four Gospels. Notice the simple yet powerful differences in the tellings of the four different Gospels. And then gently bring yourself into this time, this season, this liturgical year, this and last year's calendar year, where we are still a part of the same narrative. We are still individually and collectively killing innocent people. Sometimes slowly by not feeding them or clothing them or providing shelter for them. Sometimes by oppressing them with our notions of moral superiority, racial superiority, gender superiority, religious ideology, political ideology, all in the name of superiority. Some of us act out on social media, sitting behind screens and sending our brothers and sisters, some that we actually know and some that we do not, sending them messages of hate, using language to attack other ideas, or even their being to attack differences, whether they are actual or perceived, to attack them just the same. So this narrative that we just heard, the main pieces of this story, then and now, are still alive. 
Jesus' arrest and trial. Jesus is innocent of any wrongdoing. He is simply carrying out his call and his purpose of seeking justice for all people. He is betrayed. And he is betrayed into the hands of an establishment that carries very little for anyone who is on the lower levels of the institution or on the fringes of society. He is tried and convicted without any conclusive evidence. His story is the story of so many today who, although innocent or for whom there is no conclusive evidence of culpability, are forced to defend themselves against accusations that are untrue and unjust. In many instances, they are convicted in courts, courts that serve their own type of justice, whether it actually be courts in law or courts of public opinion that do serious harm to those who are not considered worthy in our society. Mob rule and violence. The spectacle of the storming of the Capitol is burnt into my heart and mind, and I imagine it is for you as well. Again and again, moving pictures were shown on television, and the horrific event was seen in our homes here in the United States and around the world. We see the people egged on and stirred up in very passionate ways, and the result? A mob that is too difficult to contain. This alone can bring you into the realization, a very recent one, on how the furor of the crowd that called for Jesus' crucifixion must have been like. Just a few months ago, we witnessed and we either agreed or disagreed with what we heard and what we saw. It just doesn't require much imagination to put before us the danger that exists in allowing yourself, ourselves, to be swayed by rhetoric that calls for the destruction of any person, place, or thing. It just doesn't require much imagination to reflect on the ways we as a community or we as individuals can get caught in the grip of unchecked emotion, unchecked anger, resentment, fear, sparked by the rejection of civility, the rejection and the refusal to respect and honor the dignity in all persons, and more importantly, as a first step, the rejection or refusal to take personal responsibility. The notion of power. Jesus knows that the cross is his destiny. He knows that as the incarnated flesh of God, that he has the omnipotence of the divine. And yet, he chooses not to exercise his divine power in the face of human injustice. He does not save himself at the expense of anyone else. When Pilate expresses the belief that he has the power and that his power is the greatest and therefore it can be exercised either for or against Jesus, Jesus responds with divine confidence. You would have no power, he says, not over me, unless it had been given to you from above. And this, my brothers and sisters, is another reality check for us today and in our days to come. All too often our secular leaders, our religious leaders, and we as individual members of society and leaders in our own right assert with righteous zeal 
more times than not that we have empowered the people, the people in our nation, the people in our communities, whether they be religious or non-religious, the people even in our families. And yet, we must remember that all power belongs to God. And God is the source. God gives us the power that we have in the form of gifts, talents, voices to speak, and bodies to inhabit and to use. God gives us desires to learn and to become. What do we do with this divine power? In the same way that the body of God was treated during the original telling of this story, we are treating the bodies of the divine today. The black and brown bodies, the Asian bodies, the gay and transgendered bodies, the bodies of refugees, adults and children alike. Lock them up, we say. Execute them, shoot them, strangle them, we say. Exclude them from the very basic civil rights that we get from the very basic human needs of food, shelter, clothing, health care, the list goes on, exclude them from belonging. We are still capable and we still are the followers of Jesus who are betraying Jesus and all that Jesus has modeled for us and is calling us to do and to be a force for justice and mercy justice and mercy for all people. So in closing, and again today, as we come to the end of this Holy Week, the invitation is the same as the invitation I presented on Palm Sunday, and it is the invite to stay in today. Pause and reflect with honesty, with deep compassion and awareness, for ourselves and our brokenness and our flaws. Recognize our dependence on God and Jesus' examples. Recognize our attachments to greed, power, and selfish, self-serving behavior. And then pray. Pray for the wisdom and the courage to become the followers of Jesus that will fight to keep him and all of God's creation from being handed over to oppression, to crucifixion, and even to death. And pray for the power to carry out the wise and courageous things that need to be done for the good of all people. Amen.